Now you were talking before about tax information and and agreements and all of that sort of thing. We have come to hear now in St. Kitts and Nevis the word FATCA. Sometimes mm -hmm. I think it's something you can eat. I hear FATCA. Now, you know, there have been negotiations and of course the signing of what we call the tax information exchange agreement. My question to you is what alternatives are there, arrangements to initiate a process to be removed from that list? Some person have said, well, look, the United States basically is getting us to do their job. I think, Lesra, let us be pragmatic in mm -hmm. our discussion. Um, we are all independent nations, to be sure. We all have a voice, we all have a vote. But even amongst independent nations, we have some nations that are more powerful than others. Yes. It's as simple as that. And that is a fact. I think that we can jump up and make as much noise as we want mm -hmm. about our independence and with this and with that. But at the end of the day, we can't send a single wire out of our banking system without some interaction with the United States. Right. And so the world is set up in such a way it that we cannot rights. ignore and have to take on board the realities. I call it pragmatic diplomacy mm -hmm. because that's what we have to engage in as a small country. We don't always like the rules. We don't always make the rules. But you can be certain we have to play by the rules. And sometimes it is unfair. Mm -hmm. FATCA for me is a United States effort to have other nations around the world assist them in their tax collection process. They have so far not offered any financial assistance mm -hmm. to us to put in place the necessary infrastructure to allow them to do so. Is it unfair? I think many would say yes. Mm -hmm. Is it necessary? I think the answer is equally yes. And why is it necessary? Because the alternative would be to shut down our financial system. Mm -hmm. It is a use by a powerful nation of its power. And so we have to be pragmatic in that regard. And I recognize when FATCA was debated in the parliament here, there was a lot of what I like to call cataflam about it, a lot mm -hmm. of noise, sound yeah. and fury. By the end of the day, we are all aware that the previous government had equally committed to FATCA. Mm -hmm. Not only them, Australia, Canada, most of the major countries in the world, and indeed virtually all of the Caribbean, have already committed to FATCA. Why? Because the risks to your own financial system are very real because the U.S. then reserves the right to apply sanctions and mm -hmm. the like. And the man or woman in Bastia or Charleston may think, well, why is this relevant? Well, it is relevant because you see that little money that comes to you from your auntie in, in Toronto or your, your cousin in New York in the Bronx, mm -hmm. that can be affected. You know, when you're sending up a little money for your child going to school or whatever the case, that can be affected. When you do business, so our big companies here who are trading, buying and selling, all of that can be affected because you then are affected in terms of how you use the clearing houses of the world, the, the banking system of the world. And so we swallowed hard. It's like one of those things, you know, you go to the doctor. The doctor says to you, you know, you have this particular ailment, but, you know, the medication is quite bitter. Mm -hmm. But it's, you, you swallow bitter medication mm -hmm. in order, hopefully, to make yourself Thank better. You. So I'm not going to sit here and defend FATCA. I think that it is one of those bitter pills that you're forced to swallow. Mm -hmm. um, but hopefully it is demonstrative of our mm -hmm. seriousness that as a nation, we are saying to the United States, we're saying to Canada, we're saying to the UK and Europe and all of our partners that we are a small nation, but we are serious about our nationhood. And mm -hmm. we're serious about playing our role mm -hmm. in a very uh, hostile sometimes, but ever-changing yes. global context. And I think that that message is getting through. I can tell you from my private interactions with diplomats, private interactions with ministers of foreign affairs and the like, the State Department in the U.S., the Treasury Department, I think the message that there is a wind of change that has blown over St. Kitts and Nevis, that the recalcitrance, the, the, the sort of braggadocia that hitherto informed our approach, that that has gone out the window. And what you have now are mature, sensible, reasonable people engaging in pragmatic diplomacy. Now, the Republic of China, Taiwan, has just elected its first female president, Her Excellency Dr. Tsai Ing-wen. What do you expect from Taiwan with the change of government? Of course, she has made it clear as part of, as it was a part of her campaign, mm -hmm. that she is pro-independent Taiwan. The other party, KMT, 
was more for the unification with mainland China. But um, what do you expect from, from, from the well, change of government? Well, I don't know that the KMT was for reunification. I, I wouldn't go that far. I think the KMT adopted a posture of uh, conciliation and mm -hmm. cooperation, which, which is well, maybe slightly different. Yes. So, but we, we, there's no need to debate that. I, mm -hmm. What I will answer you this way and say, that as Minister of Foreign Affairs for Sengits and Nevis, I don't try to speculate as to what Taiwan will or will not do. What I will say, is that Taiwan has been a constant and abiding friend of Sinkitz and Davis. And we would mm -hmm. expect that a new president, and congratulations to her, um, on the first female president of Taiwan, that Taiwan will continue to be a good friend to us. We have established diplomatic relations a very long time ago. Indeed, since our independence, we have had relations with Taiwan. We cooperate in so many ways, mm -hmm. some vi visual, some not so, so visual, some visible, I think is the word, some not so visible. But the reality is, that Taiwan has been a long-standing partner, and we expect Les Roy for it to remain that way. Right. And so our, our interest, as Sengis and Eves, is to continue to work with them, and it is our hope that the peace and security that has been engendered across the Taiwan streets, that that will continue. Mm -hmm. Good. Now, I have an interesting question for you. For a small island state, how far do you think we can go in terms of embassies around the world, especially from a cost perspective? Well, the cost is always a concern. Um, and setting up an embassy consulate, as a case may be, carries with it considerable cost. Uh, you have to think about security, you have to think about staff, you have to think about housing and various allowances. It can add up significantly, and that is why um, you know, foreign affairs has allocated uh, quite a significant mm -hmm. uh, budget. Um, my point, my position would be that it would be impossible for us to set up embassies in all of the, the areas that, 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 that we function. But that doesn't mean that we can't have a presence we can have a presence through the appointment of honorary consuls. In mm -hmm. fact, we have quite a few of those. I was in Morocco last year, and I was delighted that we had an honorary consul there who, who showed us around, who took care of us. Uh, we have honorary consul, uh, honorary um, I mean, ambassador, in fact. He's been elevated at uh, Doyle in, in, in uh, Paris. And these are people who are not paid by us, but who look out for our interests and when there's a mm -hmm. need to interact with those governments. And so we can have a presence not necessarily at any cost. What the CARICOM and the OECS, as well as a subset of that group, is also doing is that we are trying our best to see how we can have joint uh, missions yes. in some areas. Uh, you know, so whether it's in the United Arab Emirates or whether it's in places like Saudi Arabia, that we do a joint mission. Yes. And what we do then is share the cost. Indeed, okay. I should share with you and with the public that some countries are actually offering us the opportunity to come and set up and they their government will mm -hmm. assist with the cost mm -hmm. of the setup. So there are various scenarios and various variables. Mm -hmm. I think there's certain theaters that we have to have a presence. We must be in London. Sure. We must be in Washington, D.C. We must be in New York at the seat of the United Nations. Um, CARICOM and those, I think, we, we operate through our ambassadors uh, who are resident here but mm -hmm. who cater there. But I think through, especially now with technology, and with the appointment of honorary consuls, we can get representation sure. in a much wider sure. section of the world than mm -hmm. our pocketbook can sure. probably afford. Sure. Now, I want you to speak a little bit to the issues and how you view them in Haiti with respect to elections there. Well, having gone through a, a very sad uh, period in our own history, um, I think that wherever I see elections being delayed, or difficulties surrounding elections. Elections, let us remember, that's the touchstone of our democracy. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, freedom of speech and all of these things are important, but at the end of the day, it is through an electoral process that we elect people mm -hmm. to serve us. And so it is very important that we get things like the voters list right, we get things like the electoral laws right, and frankly, we have elections when they're due. And so I'm always concerned. I confess I don't know enough about the situation in Haiti. But certainly Haiti has had uh, its own difficulties, um, you know, historically and even recently in the last couple of years with a terrible earthquake there mm -hmm. that killed so many. They're very much in a rebuilding stage. And it would be my hope that good sense prevails and that democracy is protected. Uh, we have had our own threats here in this country where, of course, the public is aware that we had a motion of no confidence that was uh, defeated through subterfuge and 
and deceit for over two years until, of course, the people in an election brought an end to it. So elections are important, and wherever I, I see that elections are either delayed or being somehow affected mm -hmm. negatively, mm -hmm. I have a concern. Mm -hmm. um, so I would like that our friends in Haiti, um, Haiti is, of course, a member of CARICOM and a, a valuable partner, that Haiti would sort themselves out and, and make sure that they remain on the right side of history and they maintain the, the democratic sure. traditions for which they have become known in recent times. Sure. Talk about CARICOM. You just mentioned CARICOM. Where is CARICOM going? Is it going? I, I, is it coming? I, I think it's still in Ghana. I don't know if it's going <laughs> The Secretariat uh, yeah, is. The Secretariat is. But CARICOM, <coughs> CARICOM it has been much maligned. Mm -hmm. Frankly, I have maligned them myself, so I will take some responsibility for that. Um, I think that CARICOM has not been as robust as it needs to be. And frankly, when we were here in the wilderness, right, under the Douglas administration, when we suffered and we cried out because of clearly the, 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 the undemocratic practices, some may even say dictatorial tendencies that we saw coming to the fore here. CARICOM was silent. CARICOM lifted not a finger. Indeed, I share a, a joke with you in the public that I wrote to CARICOM, to the, the Secretary General of CARICOM as the, as the leader of the opposition then, and I believe I got a letter back about eight months later. And I joked to my secretary, I said, you know, even if I'd sent this by pigeon, <laughs> it would have gone and come back already. You know, so it, it, it demonstrated for me a sense. But then there's, there's that. I, I think there's a sort, sort of old boys network to some extent. Uh, one member not wanting to ruffle the feathers. In fact, uh, most of the CARICOM leaders waited until the, 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 the horse here had bolted. The die was cast before they call it. You know, it's like somebody say, you know, do you bet on right. this horse or that horse? And you wait until the horse has come in to say, that's the horse I bet on. Mm -hmm. That's what CARICOM did. So I think that they've failed us in that regard. Having said that, there are some institutions at the regional level that I think are critical to us. The University of the West Indies, mm -hmm. right, is an absolutely critical yes. institution. This uh, common market that we have, mm -hmm. our ability to move freely, the CSME, mm -hmm. um, that if you're a professional now, you can move freely within character. Right. Um, I think that there are some of these, these uniting factors that are far outweigh any negatives that there might be. Mm -hmm. And I feel that the OECS has done a better job in terms of advancing the, the cause of integration than necessarily CARICOM yes. has. Yes. But having said that, CARICOM clearly has a much wider audience yes. and a much a more, more, more diverse area to cover mm -hmm. and bigger countries mm -hmm. and so I, I would be too quick to condemn them although I criticize them heavily for the inaction when we went through our own troubles here mm -hmm. in St. Nevis. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, they have in the main provided uh, a, a platform sure. certainly for us to build upon in the Caribbean and the Caribbean will have to take a decision yes. Lesra. we are either serious about integration or we're not mm -hmm. and we will have to take a decision mm -hmm. sooner rather than later and my own view is that the way the world is aligning it is essential for us to have a common agenda and a common position. I will also say before I leave that, that one strength of CARICOM that many people may not notice is that on voting issues mm -hmm. in international fora, the numbers in CARICOM is important. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden we find ourselves being quoted by very, very big countries. Okay. Why? Because we have that 11, 12, 13 members, if mm -hmm. you will, who all have a vote. And so if you can persuade CARICOM, you have a block of votes mm -hmm. that clearly can go in your favor. And so a lot of what we see, even in terms of bilateral assistance, assistance with the CDB multi on a multilateral mm -hmm. level, it really comes from the fact that we are a part of CARICOM. Sure. Mm -hmm.